Our speaker, Professor Aliza Leroux, Chancellor Professor Bonang Mohale, who I know is on his way, Vice Chancellor and Principal Prof. Francis Peterson, members of the university executive, senior management, and Kwakwa Campus, the principal of Kwakwa Campus, Professor Prince Ngobeni, the acting dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, Professor Sam Adelabu, head of the department, Professor Liesel uh, van Us, colleagues from the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences and other faculties. A special word of welcome to Professor LaRue's family, who I also believe are joining us here today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this occasion of Professor Elisa LaRue's inaugural lecture titled, Coexisting with Curious Creatures, a significant milestone in her academic career as, and especially on this campus, as she's the first woman to be inaugurated as full professor on the Kwakwa campus. She is blushing. <laughs> Colleagues and family and friends, an inaugural is a landmark event in the academic life held on the appointment of new professors. We are delighted to have you all here this afternoon. Before we start, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the opportunity to play a small role in this afternoon's important event, but more importantly, an important signal event in a professor's tenure at an institution. It is an occasion to celebrate a life's work that culminates in the title professor, which is an occasion of great significance in the career path of an academic. When we say a life's work, we mean, Professor LaRue, that there still remains much more work to be accomplished as someone who begins the journey of professing a discipline and a body of knowledge. A professor's work, as you know, is but the beginning of much unfinished business. So this occasion also provides a platform to showcase and celebrate the University of the Free State's pride in the achievements of our academic staff, centrally aligned, as you all know, to Vision 130. The UFS is always proud to host an inaugural lecture as it provides yet another significant moment to reveal our extensive knowledge pool and the value of excellence in research, teaching, learning, and innovation. As a university, we strive to be an institution that can make a difference, that conducts groundbreaking research through disciplinary and multidisciplinary research to address the challenges facing our society, our country, and even the globe through our teaching and research. Colleagues, we recognize Professor Elisa LaRue's significant achievement and take pleasure and pride in ce celebrating the signal milestone with the wider university community and the university's publics. In keeping with tradition, I would like to now invite or request the acting dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, Professor Sam Adalabu, to introduce Professor Leroux. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. DVC Vasu, VC, and every other colleagues, all protocol duly observe. It's my privilege to introduce Professor Alisa Leru. Uh, I don't know where to start from. But when I received her CV, it was comprehensive, so I couldn't just look at how I'm going to summarize the CV. Professor Alisa Leru obtained a BSc from Stellenbosch University in 1998 and got an MSc with distinction from Stellenbosch University in 2001 and a PhD in zoology from Stellenbosch University also in 2007. 
Professor Leru started a career in July 2011 by being a scientific consultant at Aquavision TV production. Very interesting stuff that she was on the TV for some period of time. And then after completing her PhD, she was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan from February 2008 until June 2011. Professor Leroux joined the University of the Free State, Kwakwa Campus, as a senior lecturer from February 2012. And in 2018, she was promoted as an associate professor. She was appointed as the assistant dean of the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences responsible for Kwakwa Campus from January 2019 till present. And um, like, what we are celebrating today, she became a full professor from January 2024. Professor Leroux has graduated four PhDs, six MSCs, has hosted four postdoctoral fellows, and currently supervises not less than four postgraduate students. She has published over 50 peer reviewed journals, including four in 2024. She is a C2 NRF rated researcher with Scopus H index of 15 and Google Scholar H index of 20. She has received many honors in her field, including, we'll start from home, teaching and learning awards in 2014, 2020, and 2022. She's currently the editor of Biovera Ecology she is, or she was a guest editor for Special Issue in Diversity with Impact Factor of 2.4. She is the editor at Peer Community in Ecology, an open access initiative run by scientists. And currently, she is the president of Zoological Society of Southern Africa. She was an inaugural steering committee member of the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergency hosted by the Academic of Science, also South Africa. She is a member of the IUCN Species Survivor Commission Small Carnival Specialist Group. And she was a co-chair between 2018 and 2019 of South African Young Academy of Science. She regularly uh, have uh, external review of MSc and PhD thesis over many international and other South African institutions. Before I welcome Alisa to the podium, try as much as possible to get some secret thing about her because she's difficult to, to understand. And then I, I spoke with, with her parents and asked, her, asked them about the names that she has outside of the Noma Alisa that we normally call her. And um, our siblings call her normally, Halsey, CC. And uh, they also call her for Kelvin G. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please let's welcome our presenter for the day, Professor Alisa Leru. Yo, thank you for that introduction and for yeah, going behind my back to speak to my parents. <laughs> I appreciate that, but thankfully now I don't feel quite as emotional anymore as I have been feeling a little bit discombobulated the past few days. My parents nearly got stuck at an airport. I have friends that are stuck up in a mountain at, the, at our Alpine research station right now, hopefully live streaming this event from a very unusual occasion. Um, so, if I speak any untruths today, and it's recorded for everyone on the internet, please forgive my <laughs> discombobulation. Yes. Um, I would like to give you an overview of what research I've been doing so far. And it's, I wouldn't call it a lifetime's work because I hope I still have, as you said, a lifetime ahead of me, at least a couple of decades left. But I will give you, hopefully, a hint of what I hope is still to come. And 
Coexisting with Curious Creatures, I choose this title because I've been studying small mammals, uh, small carnivores and primates and so on, um, in areas where invariably they come into contact with people. And that is because we are just expanding. Our population is just expanding. It's almost impossible to avoid us. So a lot of these creatures, of these animals, like these, this yellow mongoose on this picture, uh, have to adapt to our presence. And that is part of my research as well. But I first just want to take you way back to when I started out, when I was still a young woman, a student, I had this fantastic image of what I will be one day, of what my work will be. You see me way up there. My head is not in the clouds, it's above the clouds. It's me, myself and I, no people around, except this poor guy who's taking the photo. Nobody around, just the animals. And I really thought this would be my future and I would happily traipse around studying fascinating creatures and not have a thing to do with people because frankly, people didn't interest me as much as animals. Uh, other animals, I should rather say. <laughs> but luckily, <laughs> thankfully, I was uh, deprived of this delusion that I would be doing this all on my own by the people that have come across my life. And these are just photos of people in my professional sphere of the past few years. My son is there too because he always comes along on our field trips and shows my students how to actually handle rodents without getting bitten. Um, but. What I want to emphasize with this is one thing, if, if you're not on here, come and pose for a photo afterwards, please. <laughs> but, but also, none of the work that I will be talking about is something that I've done on my own. Not even my PhD work, none of it. I've had supervisors, I've had collaborators, I've had friends, I've had people that bring me coffee at important moments of my life. If, you've, if you're on, on these photos, if you've come across my life, if you're in this room, thank you. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, this is not about my work. It's about you as well. But enough about you. <laughs> Let's get to the research I've been doing just on the non-human animals. I also research humans to some extent for the uh, teaching and learning things. But broadly speaking, my research has been on behavioral flexibility of wild mammals. And by that, I mean when an animal or a species uh, changes their behavior from the normal expected repertoire. So when they start foraging in places where they wouldn't forage before, when they start eating things or doing things that you would not expect them to have done. And this behavioral flexibility in the broader sense is, uh, we presume that underlying this is cognitive flexibility. You, you make decisions. As an animal, you decide, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Um, and cognitive flexibility, in a more narrower sense, is the ability to learn something new, but not just learn, to unlearn what you've learned and replace that knowledge with new knowledge. The ability to innovate, that would be to solve old problems in new ways or solve new problems that you've never encountered before. Um, and these two aspects of behavioral flexibility are very closely linked, but it's easy to study, well, relatively easy, to study the behavior. It's harder to study the underlying thinking, the cognition, what goes on in their heads. And this is largely what I'll be focusing on, uh, but I've been doing this kind of research on habituated animals, which means they're wild, they're walking around in their natural habitat, and through time, through patience, they've become used to us observers. We are neutral parts of their environment to some extent. So then we can see what they do in a normal day and we can experiment with them, give them puzzles to solve, give them tricks to do and see what happens. <clears throat> now as a primate, I am quite, I started out being very interested in primates and I studied the gelada monkey through the University of Michigan where I was a postdoctoral fellow. And this was up in the highlands of Ethiopia, about three kilometers above sea level. And these monkeys, they, they look a bit like hairy, shaggy chakma baboons that we are familiar with. 
But a key difference here is their social system. They have a very complex, multi-level so society. You, if you walk on the plateaus up there in the, in the Simeon Mountains, you can see between 700 and 1,000 individuals all congregating together in this large herd. And this herd can break up and come together again um, into, into bands. And in these bands, you have what we would call harems. It's basically one male unit of, in which you have one leader male that has reproductive access to between two and 11 females. And these females are uh, all closely related. Now, these males want to be the harem leader for as long as possible, as you can imagine. Um, and a lot of the communication patterns, which I will discuss with you now, uh, reflects this need to maintain social cohesion. But the very first thing I would like to talk to you about is the social intelligence that these creatures have, which we ascribe to this complex social system. Um, back in 2013, just before Valentine's Day, I published a study on cheating in monkeys. And it was literally in the Star newspaper. It was fantastic. Um, these monkeys, when they copulate, when they have sex, they both vocalize. The male and the female make loud sounds, and I am not going to do those sounds right now. <laughs> Afterwards, you can come and ask me. <laughs> but they do this. You can, you can see who belongs with whom. You can hear it miles away. Now, sometimes the females don't want to mate with this male that is their ostensible leader male. How do you get away and not get beaten up, basically, by these males? Because they're strong. They have massive teeth. So the female who wants to sneak away, she gets lost in this crowd. And then she finds a bachelor male or any other willing male, and they copulate, but they keep quiet. They suppress these vocalizations, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty smart if, if you think we come from a background where animal vocalizations are just instinctive sounds. Now you suppress that sound while you're copulating? My goodness. So this was quite uh, the evidence of deception, tactical deception, we call it, in this uh, species. But on the other hand, they also maintain peace in these societies, otherwise they'd just be warfare the whole time. And they are very vocal. I mean, you come to a, a herd or a band of gelatas, you hear them from far away. They're constantly talking. So we compared the size of the vocal repertoire, so how many sounds they make, basically, with their, their relatives, the chakma baboon, because we have a good idea of all the sounds that chakma baboons make. Mm. And we found that the gelada male, because the male is actually trying to main, maintain his leadership status for as long as possible, he needs to make nice with the females. This is not a very scientific term, I apologize. But uh, whereas chakma baboons, the males, they're at the top for a short while. They don't know what's going on with all of the females built up beneath them. They, they, they have their short tenure and they get kicked out. Gelada males make specific sounds that Chakma baboons do not. The females, they make the same amount of sounds. And these sounds specific to the males are specifically to keep peace with the females. It's when he's stressed or when the female's feeling stressed. And this is a very strange sound because, you know when we speak, we exhale. And this is what animals generally do too. You exhale, you produce the sound. In this case, the gelada males produce the sound on the inhale. It's called a wobble. And I kid you not, it sounds like this. <laughs> Mm, 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 mm. There's one. You see on the, on the picture on the left there? He's wobbling. His lip flips up like that. He sounds like... Ah, la, la, la. And this male is nervous because there are a bunch of bachelor males around. So you can imagine with all of these harems, there are quite a few unattached males wanting to get hands, their hands on a female. So I try to see, do these bachelor males make use of the social knowledge that is available to them? They are hanging around on the edges of these herds. They can basically hear from all of these copulation calls which males and females belong together. And they can probably then also figure out when there is uh, an unhappy relationship, when there's an unstable unit. And if you get to an unstable unit, you can more readily take over the unit, most likely. And just to remind you, these guys, they fight. They have takeovers in which they, they throw rocks, they, they, they break branches, they run around. And the, the vocalizations they give are very impressive. The, you know how the, we, we're all familiar with the bochum of the baboon, the chakma baboon, the whoa! Ooh, no? These guys. <laughs> they also do their version of the wahoo, and it is. Ew, 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 ew. 
My goodness. And I promise you, it's at that pitch. And I do this running around. It's a contest to see who's the strongest and who can hold out the longest. And then they can also hurt one another. So the, the, the bachelors, why, why not try and avoid all of that fuss, right, and all of that yowing? I played them sounds of males and females that belong together, males and females that don't belong together. I mixed it up a little. They didn't care. They did not pay attention to the social information that's available to them, which is a surprise, but it reminds us that there are limits, even in this highly social species, to the social intelligence, to the social cognition. And it makes sense, because honestly, in these large herds, is it worth trying to remember every single name. I mean, today I feel like I'm gonna forget my own name. It is, it takes energy, right? So, the geladas do have a lot of social knowledge, a lot of social intelligence. The ecological intelligence is not so, is not so advanced. They don't interact with human objects and things like that as much as, say, chakma baboons do. And we ascribe this to the fact that they have a simpler diet, they just eat grass, which is unusual for a primate. But closer to home, I also studied some mango monkeys, and we focused especially on their ecological knowledge. Now, we basically tested where they are experiencing the higher levels of risk, uh, because these are arboreal monkeys, they live in trees, they eat fruits and, and leaves and things like that. And we did this by placing basins in trees, in uh, gardens, in forests, overlapping their, their, popular, their um, normal home ranges. And in the basin, we put sawdust with peanuts mixed inside. At the end of the day, we go and count how many peanuts are left. This is known as the giving up density approach because in a location where they chilled out, where they're not feeling stress, they will actually sit and eat for a while and they will leave fewer peanuts behind. In a location where they are highly stressed, they're probably just gonna go in, grab a few peanuts and go off again. In other words, just by counting how many peanuts or how many food items are left, you can see what is the relative risk that they experience in different areas. And we found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that they have this vertical axis of fear. Up at the top near the canopy, they don't, they really relax, they don't feel so stressed out. But close to the ground, they are very, very stressed. And this is probably because of predators like humans, our dogs, leopards. And what was fascinating is, when we looked at this vertical axis of fear in La Juma, it's in the South Pansberg, uh, there are leopards around. This vertical axis of fear disappears. They become chilled out throughout, from the top to the bottom of the tree on the days when the researchers were following them. So they basically perceived us, this is what we think, perceived us as a shield against the leopards that are around there. And this is true, we do shield smaller animals against the larger uh, predators because we scare them away. Also, what we found using this giving up density approach is in the Hogsback, in the village of Hogsback in the Eastern Cape, that you have the um, monkeys occurring in the village gardens and in the forest. Um, and they don't like the village gardens so much. There's food, but there's also dogs and irate villagers. Only in the highest stress location, right close to the ground, do they show what we could see as goal-directed behavior. They pull at a string to get to the thing that they want. They don't show this in the more relaxed locations, which is very strange. And it, it, could, it, it reminds us that we need to take into account if an animal does something on day one and day two, but the stress levels or something varies between those days, they might show different cognitive abilities. We might not know their cognitive abilities if we ignore the stress that they are experiencing. Now, the question is, with all of this flexibility that the animals are showing, what are they gonna do as we keep on encroaching upon them? Encroach and encroach we do. So in a paper that, one of the ones that I published this year, I was one of a few experts that were uh, making predictions of uh, what the intactness of animal populations, different populations would be uh, in, on the African continent as the land use is changing. And you see on the bottom, on the horizontal axis, shows you how intact a population is expected to be. That is how close to what the population size would have been without us disturbing them, without us being around. And then the t different land use types is on the uh, vertical axis, the y axis. And you can see large carnivores in gray, they're not doing so well because we extirpate them, we try to kill them. But Primates tend to do quite a bit better. 
Also, small carnivores do better, even in plantations, rangelands, croplands, they do better than the large carnivores. And this, I think, is fascinating because it means we are going to continue interacting with especially primates and small carnivores. And what do we know about small carnivores? Very little. So just in terms of, cogn in terms of cognition, almost all of the cognitive research that's been done in t over time has been focused on primates because we are primates and we're curious about monkeys and apes. And there's been a lot of research on social birds, like crows, who are very smart, but very little, actually, on carnivores in general and even less on the small ones. Now, when I talk about small carnivores, I talk about things like foxes, mongoose, uh, even jackals, animals that are less than 22 kgs as adults. We have 55 species in Africa compared to seven large carnivores on the continent. That's a high diversity of species, but we tend to ignore them. We don't do research on them. We might persecute them like jackals. And what we do know so far is that they're highly flexible. They can change their social systems. They can change their, uh, their dietary patterns, where they live. And underlying all of this should be flexible cognitive abilities. But there's not that much research. Also, they are adorable, right? I mean, look at that little baby bat eared fox up at the top. So I've done quite a bit of research on small carnivores, and I must say my heart is leaning strongly towards them and away from the primates. Maybe it's a reflection of the human thing again. Um, but yellow mongoose here, they are called facultatively social. They are not strictly, obligately social like meerkats. Meerkats will die if they're not in a social group. Yellow mongoose don't care. Yellow mongoose tend to forage on their own. But when there's a lot of pressure, when there's not a foot enough uh, territories around, they're happy to forage in groups and, and live in their family structures. And this is a very flexible social system, and it shows in what we can figure out about their brains as well. So, for example, I will only give a few examples here, but they give flexible alarm signals depending on the social context. So if a yellow mongoose is on his own, foraging on his own, and a predator comes nearby, what he does is he puffs up his tail, that bright yellow tail with a bright white tail tip at the top, very nice visual signal, and he runs. And this signal is not aiming at other mongoose. This is a signal aimed at the predator. It tells the predator, hey, I've seen you. Look at how fast I am. You can't catch me. Give up. It's the mongoose equivalent of na 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 na, right? <laughs> and it works. <laughs> it's called officially a pursuit deterrent signal, and it works. When the mongoose is surrounded or near other mongoose family members, they don't do the puffed up tail, they give a vocal alarm signal. So in those cases they would give a growl, just it sounds like a normal tiny little growl, uh, or a peep growl, which is more like a <coughs> type thing. And that then is a signal to his conspecifics, to his group mates, right? Even their vigilance is different. They don't tend to stand up like meerkats do. Uh, because if you stand up and you're a solitary creature, you become much more visible, don't you, right? So it's safer for you to not stand up and expose yourself to risk. They just move and stop start spurts like that. And that means they still have enough time to look around for danger, but they don't have to stand up on their hind legs and expose themselves totally to danger. Which, again, is a nice adaptation to their social system. And then when we get to bat-eared foxes, which is, uh, again, I think one of the most adorable little creatures on the planet, um, look at that tiny little face. It's not just cute, but that little muzzle, it is specialized for foraging on ants and termites. Termites and ants are their main food base, and they have special jaw musculature and teeth to snap up the termites and ants like that. Um, so they're not your typical foxy hunter that just eats anything that comes across their path. And what we found studying a population in the Kalahari Desert is that they can learn and unlearn new tricks. We taught them at first, my students made them come to, to them uh, by wrinkling a bag full of um, raisins, because they love raisins, did you know that? They came and then I was like, mm, maybe it's not good that we're training wild animals to come to people when something goes, <laughs> right? So all of this, these foxes were trained to associate good things with, with that sound. They unlearned it too. Very quickly, the students were able to teach them to come to a dog whistle, which obviously doesn't make much of a sound to us. So this is a sign of some intelligence. Despite the fact that they're specialist termite feed, uh, eaters as well, we've seen some evidence of fantastic variety in what they eat. Um, 
when you lactate, when you are a mother and you have to provide milk, it takes uh, an intense physical strain on you. It places a lot of strain on you, right? You need to eat a lot. The male cannot bring food back home. How do you provide a mouthful of termites to the female? It's not possible, right? So the male stays at home, babysits. There's a lot of paternal care in this, in this um, species. The female is out there all night just foraging, foraging, foraging on teeny tiny termites, except if you're Bertha. So this one female, she went out one night, hunted, killed, and ate a hare, which was about her same size. Imagine you can do that. I mean, no. And the same female, on a few other nights, she started just hunting rodents like it was her job. She killed so many rodents on a single night that she had to cache them and bury them for, for later use. And this is an animal that eats termites and ants. Hmm? It's not just the females, though. The males, they're also nice dads. So we saw a, a specific male who was out taking his pups on a little foraging trip, and they were walking with him, and he presented them with a cow dung patty. Now, it's not so that they could eat the poop, I don't think. I don't think they were having a fight. Uh, it's probably so that they could eat the grubs and things that were inside the, food, inside the dung patty. Now, isn't that an innovative way of provisioning to your offspring when you don't have the normal option that larger jackals and foxes would have? So, I suspect that in the yellow mongoose, as well as the um, bat foxes, the pressures, the stresses associated with parenting can actually lead to quite a lot of innovation. But the NRF hasn't been giving me money to keep studying that, unfortunately. <laughs> but I'll, I'll get there. I'll get there again. And I just want to also nod to the one small carnivore that most of us do not like. We find it a little bit intimidating and scary, the black-back jackal. And uh, my student Alex Buerta and I were studying these uh, jackals in the mountains of Kwa Kwa and discovered they were not so easy to habituate, which is a good thing. But also, on moonlit nights, they are more explorative. On moonlit nights, not dark nights, they would, go, they would venture farther and they would also come into Puta di Chaba most likely to look for, you know, eggs and rubbish and birds and thing, you know, chickens and so on. And this was a surprise because jackals learn to avoid people very quickly. They don't like us. They avoid our traps. If you've trapped a jackal once, you can't trap them again. We could never get the radio collars off them again. They wouldn't come back to our traps, ever. And, um, and yet, on the nights when we are most active, we are better on bright nights because we're visual species, right? So on the nights when we are more of a threat, they don't care. They still come out and they're more active. So that bears some more thinking about, but yeah, I need to get more jackals to study. Now, what's the meaning of all of this? All of this fascinating research, I find it fascinating, but the importance here for me is that we interact with small carnivores especially, and we don't even think about it. We wear fur, we, uh, we hunt them. Uh, especially, you know, farmers, they tend to just try to kill every jackal they find. Um, serval can be, um, these are, see, I'm now forgetting things. Serval are occurring in the highest densities in industrial sites, uh, in Secunda. Uh, I've, had, I've had a genet running across my stoop more than once, just over here in Clarence. So they're close to us. We interact with them, whether it's deliberately or uh, inadvertently. Okay, so what? I don't want to scare you, but a study by Han and colleagues in 2016, before COVID, uh, in, in, in this study, they were looking at which species have zoonotic diseases, which species harbor zoonotic disease. A zoonosis, a zoonotic disease, is the kind of disease that can jump from an animal to humans and cause illness or disease in humans, like COVID and rabies. And if you look on the right-hand side there is the bats. Now, bats are the great scapegoats. We don't like bats and because they carry disease. But if you look at the African continent there, we, if the, the reds and the purples are where you have the most species with zoonotic disease. It's not such a high threat on the African continent. However, if you look at carnivores on the left-hand side, my goodness, these are just the species that we know have zoonotic disease. So my goodness, before you now go out and try to shoot every fox and mongoose that you see, I want you to take a step back and remember, we are also experiencing unprecedented biodiversity losses. Thank you. Uh, one of my wonderful students. <laughs> um, 
and especially in the African continent, it's, the, uh, it's mass extinction events. And there is research showing that a healthy, biodiverse ecosystem protects us against disease. Because if there's a bunch of other hosts out there, the disease or whatever the danger is just circulates amongst the animals and doesn't necessarily jump to us. This is on top of the other uh, you know, benefits that small carnivores bring us, like eating termites, like eating rodents and things like that. So it's not, we, we must balance the risk of potential disease, which we don't really know, we haven't quantified it enough, with the risk of losing all of these animals. Now, that is where I see my future research going, is studying how, the, especially small carnivores, uh, what, did, what rewards and benefits they get from close to, being close to us and vice versa. So I've been trying to hone some skills in working outside academia because if you want to change people's minds, if you want to uh, change the way we interact with wildlife, you have to work with people and convince people of things and get to understand people. So I've been writing things for uh, magazines occasionally. This, which is one of my favorite cartoons, uh, it looks like the ideal job being a bat eared fox's shrink. Um, this, was com this comes from an article in the Farmers Weekly where I spoke about the intelligence in farm animals. And it was fascinating because after this paper came out, people called me asking me, can I please, can I please advise them? They have these cases where they're trying to uh, stop new chicken batteries from being built, things like that. I don't get responses like that when I publish in a normal journal, now do I? Mm. <laughs> and I've also, since COVID, uh, been part of the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, as Sam was saying over there. And our task as experts was to bring other experts together and create awareness, amongst others, in the form of advisories, about unfolding emergencies, either in the environment or in the political sphere or the health sphere. And what is fascinating is two, two of the articles that are two of the advisories that I wrote had consequences, real world consequences. Now, I'm not saying that it's just the articles that I wrote, but what happened is that the, the, art, the advisories that I was part of um, was part of the evidence that other activists and experts were then able to use to stop, ooh, to stop governmental overreach, basically to build mines where mines shouldn't be built in biodiversity. Uh, areas, rich areas, and to stop co companies from overreach again, just unthinking exploration without pausing, reflecting, and thinking about what you're doing. So I'm hoping that I am now, you know, honing my skills to uh, get into the future where we can actually change the way that we interact with these small carnivores in a way that's to their benefit and to our benefit. But there's a long way to go, and I'm excited about it. And thank you very much for being here and for mm, sharing this occasion with me. And I don't know if anybody's going to tell them where the food is, but it's just around the corner and it's lovely. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> Colleagues, I'm old fashioned. I have a piece of paper. I can't fiddle on the phone. And I hate it when the students fiddle on the phones. <laughs> Aliza, you became a zoologist because humans piquate your curiosity. She wanted to know why we, as humans, use so many words. We just talk, talk, and talk. Whilst our evolutionary brothers and sisters are most of the time actually mute. The fact that she um, is so excited about the animal mind might explain when we have to function afterwards, she's going to ignore us because she doesn't want like to talk to people. <laughs> In her presentation, she confirmed that these mammals are coexisting with us outside their traditional protected habitat do manage their own risk challenges by adapting their behavior. She illustrated how foxes and jackals increase their foraging activities at moonlight nights, 
despite the risk of humans and the fact that they can even encounter larger predators. It's amazing to note that the jackals also quickly learned how to avoid her traps. In the case of the Samango monkeys, they have their own activated trap evolving behavior and techniques, and in doing so, they start to foster and feed in forested areas where it's safer, but still um, the risk of human activity increases as well. Through her research, Prof. Aliza indicated that these curious creatures do not intensively become nuisance um, animals. However, we can manage it much more effectively, especially if we, as humans, think more carefully of what we're doing, how we distribute land and how we use the land around us. Under pressure, small carnivores and monkeys can show impressive cognitive flexibility. For example, again, the Samangu monkeys, which exhibited that pull stringing and behavior that they had. And the fact that they actually do that the moment they're closer to our gardens, again, the risk of humans that, that's um, evolving with it. Back here, foxes display reversal learning and quickly also learned how actually to solve puzzle boxes. Some of her work showed that there, there are cognitive limitations in how the mammals respond to the environment. Again, keeping in mind that we as humans modified these habitats and with the modification of these habitats, we actually create numerous spaces for these animals to start to um, um, intervene again. And again, we have the human risk with it. Changing environmental and social pressure, health and disease profiles of the world the urban wildlife can become distinct from these populations in undisturbed areas. Unfortunately, we don't know what is that detail yet. So your, your couch, um, NRF, where are you? It's online, listen, so that you can do your, <laughs> that you work. Prof. Lisa emphasizes that we need to understand also the biotic responses to human interaction and the changing agriculture pressure that we have and the practices associated and surrounded with agriculture. We also need to consider that, um, that we overlook these curious um, creatures um, and that they actually deserve much more attention. If we want to avoid a biodiversity crash and we don't want to be reminded of another pandemic. Aliza, um, I googled you. And it, uh, yes, there's a block. <laughs> and on that block, it says that communication for you remains the heart of science. So from my side, Unfortunately, you will have to talk now to us while you continue stalking the small mammals. And thank you for your delightful presentation. <laughs> okay, now, this bunch of flowers is not from me. I'm just a carrier. It's from everybody trapped on the mountain, and specifically from Sandy and the rest of the faculty. I call now um, on uh, Prof to do that. Um, um, thanks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dumelang, Awushin, good afternoon. I stand here today as a proud and grateful University of Free State Kota Campus principal to express my heartfelt thanks to all those who have made this event possible. I would like to start by thanking our management, Professor Peterson, our Vice Chancellor and the Principal, Professor Vasuredi, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Professor Ante Aruda, our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning. Who have always, you have always been supportive to our initiatives and encourage us to strive for excellence. Prof. Leru, you have made us proud, specific, especially the Tata campus. You have made us very, very proud. And I would like to thank you and con we congratulate you. I will, I will also like to extend my gratitude to our staff and students who have made our guiding lights, imparting wisdom, and the knowledge to us 
and nurturing our talents. Their unwavering support has been instrumental in our growth and development. I would like to express my appreciation to our guests who have taken time out of their busy schedule to grace this occasion with their presence. Your presence has added an extra spark in this event and made it even more special. I would also like to thank each and every one of you for your support and participation in making this event a grand success. Your contributions have not gone unnoticed and I'm, and I, I'm grateful for all that you have done. I would like to invite all the guests for tea and refreshments and please remain seated for a moment to allow Prof. Fleru to take a place at the door so that she can be congratulated by our guest. Thank you.